thanks for joining us today. We are here to uh, have a discussion about uh, patient data, patient privacy, and whether or not uh, patients and consumers should be compensated for sharing their data. Um, I am Jan Oldenburg, and I focus on digital health from a consulting standpoint. I'm joined here today by Nyan Yaragi, who's an assistant professor of operations and information management at the University of Connecticut School of Business. He's also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. His research is focused around health information exchange and patient privacy. And Casey Quinlan blends her background in network news and stand-up comedy to inform her health policy work. She writes, she speaks, she facilitates at the Festivus airing of grievances in healthcare, and her favorite people to work with are those who want to fix the system, not serve the status quo. So I think with that note, I think um, we'll get started. I wanted to actually start us out um, with a quote from an article about uh, startups mining the healthcare gold rush. Um, they basically said that patients generally accept giving information to doctors in return for better health care. Consumers also accept giving some personal data to commercial companies in return for benefits, such as discounts. But these are two clearly established contexts for data sharing, but they have very different motivations and mindsets and assumptions that go with them. When commercial companies are involved in health services and in health research, the distinction between these contexts collapses. Unsure whether we are using a service or making a transaction, we find it harder to assess the risks and benefits of our data being made accessible. So with that context, let's start um, from the standpoint of each of you talk a little bit about um, your focal point on, in particular, whether consumers should be compensated in some way for the data that they share um, with anybody, frankly, and the data that's collected about them and resold, or not. And if so, please uh, do it briefly, but give us a little context for your point of view. And I think perhaps it might make sense to start on this with Casey. Okay. Um, my point of view is relatively simple, and it, you know, I, I will admit that I, I, I come at this because I do want to break all existing paradigms on this, and uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not looking to preserve any kind of status quo here. I'm looking to completely disrupt business as usual. Now that said, uh, I am certainly uh, an outlier, at least as far as as you know conventional thinking goes on this. I'm more of an outlier and you know, more of a troublemaker than I am someone who's you know looking to build consensus around currently existing platforms. But my sense is that because we're out, you know, we're past an agrarian economy, we have been for a while. And then we shifted through the industrial economy and we now seem to be, I mean, it's not as though we don't make anything anymore, but what we really tend to make these days, at least as far as the you know, developed world's economy, what we tend to make these days is a whole lot of data. And not as though that cannot be put to great use by enterprise to serve the needs of the people that are their customers. But at the same time, because of that sort of sense on the part of at least the established you know, uh, enterprises that are involved in this, in this game, and this is absent not just patient data, I'm talking about all that data that we create with these things, you know, excuse me, it was plugged in, these things and, and you know, the things we're on now, um, you know, the, our digital lives. Being able to unlock some of the, the financial benefit from that to create citizen benefit beyond just, yeah, I got a discount from insert thing here, or, you know, yeah, there was a whole bunch of clinical trial stuff that my data got added to and they came up with a new drug for something. Um, you know, I, and, and if, 
if the payment thing is too much for somebody to wrap their mind around, well, there are other benefits, but I would like to see those benefits defined concretely for the individual who is contributing. In other words, someone who contributes their data to a project that comes up with a new drug for a problem that they have. I would like to see them get that drug at, for free, at least for some good period of time, if not for life, in life. perhaps free use of the device that is delivered from it. But, um, you know, the, the, to me, the idea that there would be no financial dividend to the people upon whose data these products are created, um, you know, I, I, I want to break the paradigm and I want to move us in a new real shared economy direction and not just a sharing economy limited to, you know, like Uber and asking for money for help, you know, go, go fund me to pay for my medical bills or whatever. So, I mean, I realize I wandered around there a little bit, but bottom line, I think that if we're making it, we should get a dividend from it and not just feel good. Yeah. Hey, big corp helped the world. And so I should sit over here and just be happy with that. Uh, Great. Thank you. Yes, please. So, you know, I, in theory, agree with the notion that there should be some mechanism for patients to also benefit from the potential profits that uh, for-profit organizations make out of this data. However, I think when it comes to practice, there are two major uh, challenges. The very first one is to uh, come up with a fair evaluation of the value of the data. Uh, it is absolutely correct that there are there is a multi-billion industry on patients' data. However, uh, the value comes pr primarily from the collection, cleaning, and analysis services that companies perform on that data. Uh, on Twitter discussion, I gave the example of a crystal maker who makes a very beautiful, valuable crystal uh, you know, artifacts out of uh, sand. Uh, sand is, uh, is out there, but uh, it is the art and the expertise and the skills and the technology of the crystal maker who transforms that, uh, you know, sand into, into beautiful crystal. So the very first question that we have to think about is uh, how much is the value of a single patient's data? The second part is, even if we could come up with that, in, and even if we could come with a very high valuation, so you may say, oh no, patient's data is not sand, it's, it's gold. Uh, and let's say that everybody agreed that we're gonna give 50% of the total profits that is made in this industry to patients. The, the next question is how? How are you going to build a mechanism, uh, which I'm specifically referring to a, a tracking and accounting mechanism that can identify the exact value created by my records and establishing a system that can compensate me fairly based on the uh, previously agreed amounts. Uh, and the cost of building that system and implementing and managing that system will eat into most of the costs, uh, most of the profits that is currently being made. So I think uh, at the end of the day, we will end up uh, redistributing uh, very small amounts of money uh, to patients and we'll give them pennies in the short run. But uh, in the long run, we will uh, stop this business from flourishing, which uh, has a lot of indirect benefits for the patients, you know, let's face it, we have a lot of problems in the U.S. Healthcare, pro healthcare system, costs and inequality are two major problems that we have, but uh, we are also on the forefront of medical discovery and medical science when it comes to pharmaceuticals and finding new uh, drugs for things. There are a lot of noise involved there. There is a lot of drugs that are created that do not make any sense, but at the same time, uh, we are advancing every day and we are giving hope to many patients every day. So I, as a patient, uh, would like to uh, forego the potential short-term short benefits in terms of dollars 
for the potential long-term benefits that may be uh, life-saving drugs and life-saving advances in medical science uh, that these companies may come up with out of using my data. Um, so before I turn to Casey and ask her to talk about um, some of those mechanisms, um, not all of the data that people are using are being, you know, not all the data that's being gathered is being used for a social good like the creation of um, new drugs. Some of it, in fact, might be used against patients, mm -hmm. i.e. by their insurers to uh, change or alter how much they have to pay for services. So under those circumstances where it's potentially my own data that is being used against me, how do you, um, w w what's your argument there? So I think there is already some laws and regulations in place that protects patients against that. I think HIPAA was designed based on those concerns and then ACA, the protections against pre-existing conditions, was put in ACA because of those concerns. Those are valid concerns and I think uh, there is enough regulations to stop that. Now, uh, even if you think that there is not enough regulation and there is not enough protection for patients against uh, that for companies that use their data against them, which again I say is a very very valid point, I do not think giving ownership to patients or to physicians would save that, uh, would solve that problem. And uh, you know, and I say that because I think uh, a discussion about who owns medical data is not a good discussion because regardless of the the conclusion that you come up with, you either believe that patients own the data or you either believe uh, physicians own the data. Both of these conclusions will have very dangerous ramifications. And let me give you an example. So if I say that a physician owns my data, it means that I'm implying that if a physician wanted to destroy my data, he can do it because it's his property, which absolutely is not something that we want. And if I say, I, as a patient, own my data. It means that, well, I can first edit my medical data, which is not good, or I can, for example, prevent CDC from having access to my data in order to uh, predict the outbreaks of uh, viral diseases, for example, which is, again, something that we do not want. I think a better discussion is about uh, uh, stewardship of patient data and thinking about who is more suited to uh, steward uh, patient data and how we have to make it financially possible. Thank you. Casey, what's your perspective on these points? The ownership question um, or the broader question about um, you know, being able to use it um, in a regulatory framework? Well, actually, I think both of them are important points. Okay. So let's start with the ownership. And then well, I mean, I, I agree that um, that that having just a one sole owner in this zone is a bit problematic. But I will go back again to my point that I do think that looking at this and absent just patient data, talking about all the data that citizens create, of which certainly health data is a piece. But looking at this as, as the ultimate opportunity to create a new economy. And you know, sort of my, my meme or my mantra around this is social enterprise, not socialism. And coming up with a way, you know, I do think that um, having the person who creates the data have primary ownership rights with stewardship assigned to those who may be you know, able to use it in a meaningful way in a transaction that does not involve direct payment in other or you know, could, but like, okay, I'm doing this and it's because I went to the hospital and, you know, the hospital data is now primarily mine, but there's a co-ownership and a stewardship piece with the doctor and the hospital and, um, you know, my insurer who is paying for this or Medicare or Medicaid, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, I really think that the, the paradigm of ownership is almost problematic right now because there's enough emerging enterprise around this concept of people 
having primary ownership rights to their data. That there, you know, uh, there's uh, companies. I'm, you know, looking at the list here. There's Humantive, Citizen, um, Humanity, um, and some others that are looking at helping people, and they're all in the healthcare space. To be clear, um, they're uh, looking at ways to help people aggregate their data and then work together as opposed to just being a single patient out there. Oh yeah, you got my thing and I want 50 cents for every exchange. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that, that would be unwieldy and I'm not expecting anyone on the data aggregator side. In other words, the people who are getting the data and doing something with it, um, I'm not expecting them to come up with a monetization play. I do think that it's on us, the citizens to start figuring out both that we want this and also creating frameworks where that can happen. I think that gathering together in co-ops and other group structures will force this to become at least a topic for discussion and possibly an economic movement. Uh, we have to get started somewhere. So that's why I'm rattling around out here saying, I want you to pay me for my data and here's how, you know, I think that this could work. And the way that it could work is to band together in, in co-ops. So back to your question about ownership. Um, hang, hang on, hang on. Before, yeah. you get to, before you go there, it occurs to me that we should have defined some terms before we started. Okay. And, um, so I'm going to interject it here because I think it in the, um, how we define the terms affects a little bit how we're thinking about this. So I want to distinguish... Um, traditional clinical healthcare data that is collected uh, in the context of hospitals and um, insurers and um, uh, ambulatory care centers from a wealth of other data that can be used to derive health status. Mm -hmm. And that might be data from a wearable, almost certainly not protected by uh, HIPAA or from my phone, or it might be um, data from my television viewing habits, my texting habits, my um, how much time I'm spending on the internet, et cetera. So that's the broader ecosphere of information about me that might be used to derive health information or could be used in conjunction with health information to give a better, a broader picture. So let's assume, you know, one, the first element, the clinical data is indeed protected by HIPAA and there are the ACA protections against using that data to discriminate against me, at least they still exist today. Um, and then the other set of data is I think a little bit more of a wild west. So as you uh, think about the ownership, Casey, I think um, it's perhaps a little difference between the two kinds of data. Well, we yeah, but I will say that even the clinically created data, i.e., you know, hospital stays, et cetera, um, is still part of the larger data set that is being mined, quote unquote, de-identified although that induces a horse laugh every time I hear it because I do know about Latanya Sweeney's work. But um, yeah, I just, I, I think that there's very little way to separate that out. I mean, granted, in the, the stuff that's in the EHR, you know, the, the electronic health record, and you know, the billing stuff from your insurer or Medicare or Medicaid, is protected under HIPAA. It is, you know, supposed to be inside a walled garden. Uh, sometimes that's not so much, um, but it, it gets, the, the question gets polluted and so does the data security thereof. When people, as they are wont to do, have conversations and, you know, activities outside the walled garden around the issue that they're dealing with, you know, I mean, all you have to do is go on Facebook and find every patient community and every condition community under, you know, the sun. And oh, by the way, in case you didn't know, all that data is out there in the wild unless it was created since late July. And even then, I think Facebook hasn't really plugged the holes. But, you know, damn. Anyway. So I think I, I dragged this off, off the, you know, off the play. We're in the weeds again. I'm good at that. <laughs> so, Niam, uh, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, from a standpoint, both of the argument Casey's making that 
we could um, figure this out. That we don't perhaps have models for it today, but we could figure it out in collaboratives. But also the idea that all health data is not what we have traditionally thought of as health data and thus is not protected by some of the existing frameworks that we've got. Um, how do you address those issues in terms of your model that says industry is entitled to profit from it because they are actually manipulating that data in some fashion? You know, I totally agree with Casey's first point. I think uh, she, uh, she is different from uh, most uh, people, at least on social media, that I hear. And to summarize their perspective is that they want to have their cake and eat it at the same time, meaning that they uh, believe that uh, nobody should profit from their data. And at the same time, nobody should charge them for uh, keeping their data. Uh, and, and I really love that she's talking about some uh, financial models, some economic models, being uh, co-ops being one of them. Uh, when we're talking about co-ops, we're in essence, we're talking about an economic model in which a group of people uh, share their resources together in order to finance an IT infrastructure that can store that data and clean that data and also uh, you know, protect that data against uh, many different privacy risks and security breaches that we may potentially have. And if you do that, uh, I, I, I think you have all the rights to your data. Why? Because you have built a warehouse, a digital warehouse. You're paying for that warehouse and you want to store something that belongs to you. All right. And nobody has any rights to that. However, if I say I am not going to pay for that warehouse, and I just want to store my belongings into that warehouse. And I, at the same time, do not want to allow whoever has invested in building and managing and protecting that warehouse to, to benefit from my belongings there. Uh, it's, it's financially impossible. You cannot do that. You know, the very, you, so you may uh, succeed in uh, setting up a law that says it is completely illegal for anybody to have financial gains from sharing uh, patient data. Uh, that is totally possible. What will happen immediately after is that all of these businesses who have invested in this will go out of business. Then I will be left with keeping my own medical records and Casey and I should sit together to think how we can build a co-op to keep those records. Well, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm going to break in here and I'm going to say that I think that um, one of the things that you've run into more than once with me mm -hmm. um, in these conversations is um, a, a, a poor use of metaphor that ends up becoming the flame point for the conversation that, you know, or, the, you know, the, the argument, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, that fa the Festivus airing of grievances, I've got problems with you people. But, um, you know, the, the metaphor is key in being, and, you know, I say this as a professional communicator, the metaphor is key if you want to get your point across. So you went through, and I mean, you know, you, you didn't bring it up here, but I'm going to, sorry, dude. It's out there on Twitter. The soda can thing, ooh, that was a bad, that, don't go there, don't do that again. The sand, ee, because when you're dealing with human beings, you have to remember that you're talking about humans. Now, the warehouse analogy, about so, you know, like, so let me let no, me just is, no, but let me let me finish. Okay. The warehouse <laughs> analogy has legs because that <clears throat> that does make it clear that it's like okay, so a dude has a, some a thing, you know, a, you know, a, a lump of thing, and then there's another group, person, enterprise, whatever, that has a storage place. We will call it a warehouse for that thing, and this guy wants to put his thing in that warehouse but not pay for it. And that's as crazy as a guy saying, you, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to build a warehouse that's going to encompass the entire goddamn town, and then you're going to have to pay me to live in the town. That's kind of the way we have got a lot of the points of view around data <clears throat> aggregation and data used for commercial purposes when the people who create that data are not really cut in in any way on the interest, the financial interest in that data beyond being told that they'll have some cool thing down the way that they can, you know, that, that, that will be delivered to them, that then they can buy at a discounted price. Wait a minute, 
But <laughs> so I, you know, it's like I, I do think that we, as a society, as a as a species, are going to have to start having some really hard discussions around this because so, the current the capitalism model, as po you know, as positive as it was for a lot of people, really, if you look at it, the way it's spun out is it turned into a really good wealth concentration model. So now if we're going to move humanity forward, how about we come up with a new model that lets the capital still aggregate and that, you know, the people who actually produce things can, can win, you know, for themselves and their, and their group based on their contributions, but that we don't run over the rest of humanity with big old tank treads while we're doing it, using the data that they create to create this brave new world, so. So let me, let me respond. I, I think you made three points, and so let me uh, respond to each of At them least. one by one. <laughs> First of all, you know, when I, when I made that metaphor about uh, patient's data being so, uh, patient data being so uh, ubiquitous that it is just like sand and the person makes crystal out of sand. Uh, people on Twitter were also raising the exact same point and say, hey, you're talking about humans. I'm not talking about humans. I'm not equating humans with sand. I'm equating humans data with sand. And I, and I guarantee you, we as humans create so many things that are worth much less than sand, okay? They pollute environment. So it is in no way, uh, equating humans or patients with sand, I am equating their data. Or soda cans, sand. don't forget the soda cans. And, or soda cans, or if I say patient's data, it's just like soda cans. Well, I, I don't think data is sacred in any way, means or form, okay? It is just something that we emit uh, as Ones humans. Ones and zeros. Then the second thing is you said you are uh, describing these, uh, digital platforms that store data as warehouses. Well, it is not a metaphor that I mean. It's literally its name. It's called digital warehousing in information systems tools. Uh, many of us teach data warehousing. So it is literally something. And it is not a warehouse that encompasses the whole town. Or even if it is, I give you an example. The, we have an example in, in real life, the taxes that I pay uh, to uh, for, for my property, you know, it is impossible to build a house anywhere in the United States without paying property taxes. Uh, and as a resident of Connecticut, I, as you can imagine, I'm not happy with those property taxes. I lived in New York for years. I know how it works. Yeah. <laughs> so, so at, but at the same time, I understand that if I want to be able to send my child to a good school, I have to pay those taxes. So it, I, if, if there is somebody who believes that these property taxes are outrageous, at the same time, they cannot argue that, oh, I want a free public school as well. So you, you can only have one of these two things. You either have to pay property taxes or uh, you're gonna have uh, you know, private schools. You cannot have uh, a situation which says that, you know, uh, it is impossible to have a house built anywhere in the United States without paying taxes. I don't like this system. And at the same time, I want a really good public education system. So well, you've just uh, described a lot of problems around the public education system in this country, but we're not here to talk about that. Yeah. No, 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 no. I just wanted to, you know, that's <laughs> the point that you were, you were making, you know, and then the third thing you, you told that I'm a capitalist. Although I do not take any offense in that, I am a capitalist, proudly. But uh, I don't think that even if you were a socialist, uh, to whatever definition it may have, uh, if you're, let's say, not a capitalist is a better definition, you can go anywhere. I mean, you cannot avoid math. And, uh, it, you know, if you if you really want to have a system in which the patient's data is not monetized, or if it's monetized, patients get their share, I think you should also start thinking about, okay, how am I going to build that infrastructure? And Why I said social enterprise, is, not socialism. No, I mean, social enterprise, not socialism. I think, you know, that's, yeah. like I said, I'm going to become boring on this. But um, because that's sort of my, you know, my tagline right now for this topic. 
but uh, you know that's why I see the um, you know the, the the social enterprise piece as being um, key to you know the co-op deal you know what I was you know speaking of before the aggregation of the humans who have an interest in this it, to come together to create their own aggregation of data that they can then put out or you know make available to whomever and i mean some of the not commercial you, you know things that are active right now in that area um are all of corey painter from the broad institute's projects around you know the metastatic um breast cancer project and the angiosarcoma project etc where people who are affected by those diseases and who have you know genomic data and other you know treatment data are aggregating it and they're turning it into a giant learning machine to try to figure out how to defeat these these cancers come up with new treatments but you know that i don't know what the model is there if there is one on a commercial side because i know that corey being a pure scientist is probably not thinking about money in this and mm -hmm. most researchers in that zone ne don't necessarily unless they're you know they're inside pharma but anyway um i do think that that looking at this as an opportunity to start creating a new economy um one that because capitalism in its current form has again turned in you know seemed to turn into a really good wealth concentration engine and it's like you know it's like i don't have anything against the idea that somebody could get really 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 rich but the issue that i have is that there are so many people who are struggling despite the fact that they work and you know whatever they just can't you know we need to come up with some sort of a a an opportunity engine for people who don't come from inherited wealth can't go to college for whatever reason um, or, you know, or maybe they're just brilliant at being a diesel mechanic. It doesn't matter. But, you know, we're people who can start to figure out how to bring their best gifts to bear on their life in the world, rather than just having to, you know, yoke themselves to, a, you know, minimum wage job ad infinitum because they cannot climb out of that pit. So, yes. Okay, Jan. I, I think, you know, inherent is in this discussion is a certain amount of um, assumptions about choice and individual choice about their data. And I'd like to go that direction for a little while because um, I think it's one of the things that potentially both distinguishes it and it's perhaps a, um, a necessary precondition if you will, to any of these models really working for the individuals. So one of them is, one aspect is, um, lots of times people are not aware of what they're signing away when they sign away their data, um, or when they give it up for a- Nobody reads the terms benefit. of service. <laughs> Correct. Or they're not aware of how information about them is being used. For example, um, and I'm going to take a non-healthcare example for a moment, um, when I get the ads from Google and I want to see why am I being presented with this particular ad, the information is actually very opaque. It doesn't actually provide anything that allows me to really understand what it is about me or to trace back to where I actually gave permission for that. So there's somehow embedded in this an idea of both choice and how much choice I have about what data about me is used and where, and also uh, transparency in terms of what use is being made of it. And it feels to me as if we're going to create a new economy out of this, um, one that actually incorporates some self-determination and agency on the part of people, which at least I would posit is a good thing, then I think we need to uh, actually address this idea of how and where people make choices about their data. And that gets to issues about um, whether my data can truly be de-anonymized, for example, especially when we start living with genomic data being shared. 
and what some just of the ask the Golden about. State Killer about that. Although that was a good use of anyway. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, can you guys talk a little bit about this idea of agency and choice as it applies both potentially to the whole idea of how data is shared and used, but also to the economic models? Can I start? Please. So, uh, I, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, uh, a while ago, I actually wrote an article and even proposed uh, to some extent, a business model that enables that choice. You know, I think when you give patients choice, they can benefit both economically and medically. Uh, the example that I gave, for example, was about Alzheimer's disease uh, and the research that shows, uh, uh, you know, if you catch it early, uh, then you could have much more success in dealing with it and treating it. And what the point that I was raising is that uh, I really, as a patient, am very, uh, uh, as, as an individual, I'm very concerned about this. And if there was a system that I could share my data with researchers or even for-profit organizations that could use that data in order to predict if in, let's say, the next 10 years, I will become an Alzheimer's patient, uh, they, ca they could catch it right now and help me fight it. Uh, and, and there I was even advocating for identified data because there are some people like me who are willing to share uh, at least a part of their data, let it be medical or non-medical, for purposes uh, such as a system that tells me that if you share your data with me, I will tell you when you will have Alzheimer's. You know, that is a sweet deal. I, I even went forward and said, there are instances that identified data is so valuable that people may tell me we're going to pay you for your data and build that system and let people who are you know want to make some money out of their data which they're rightly so entitled to be able to get reimbursed for that you know the whole notion behind it is that uh, for any financial transaction uh, i as a patient should you know demonstrate value and those two examples I think cases where uh, patients significantly create value and they should be compensated for that so uh, that that is one thing then the other thing is that there was a time not so long ago that we as individuals or as uh, Casey wants to refer citizens we're not very aware of what is it that we are doing online, okay? Nobody read and nobody still reads those uh, terms of use and agreements. However, I think people have a pretty good idea about uh, the risks that, are, that they are taking when they go online. You know, uh, somebody many years ago, I think uh, it was the CEO of, uh, of I, I, I don't exactly remember which of these companies, but said, Get over it. There's no such thing as privacy. And uh, although it's uh, very uh, unfortunate, but I think he was right. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 and th there is a good reason for that. Because, and th I wrote an article when the GDPR came out, uh, arguing that we as individuals are paying for the services and products in a new currency. And that currency is our privacy, it's our private information. So private information has a value. So rather than paying Google uh, for a subscription, I tell Google or I implicitly agree with Google that you can uh, take my private information, monetize it, and in return, let me use your services for free. Uh, so I, I, I think that issue of awareness uh, along, to, uh, you know, as time goes by, gets uh, much better, although it's not going to be solved uh, completely. And if there is any effort that tries to bring awareness about uh, these terms of conditions and the risks that individuals take when they go online or where they share their data with these different organizations, I'm all about it. I'm all for it. I, I would, before I turn it over to Casey, I would just note that your argument works much better if I actually have the choice of using Google as a paid subscription mm -hmm. uh, versus as a free subscription. Or and Facebook. Not, or exactly. 
you know, where, um, where in that sense, I have some agency about how I use the service and how much of my privacy I give away. But yep. case and, and I'll, you know, I'll say that, that for a lot of, a lot of the places where large numbers of people hang out online, particularly the aforementioned Google and Facebook, and yeah, you know, I mean, I think that it's true on Twitter too, although that seems to be a place where people are a little bit more aware that basically everything I say here is public. And I mean, unless it's in a DM. But um, you know, the, the, the issue is that they can change those terms of service later. Mm -hmm. They can do that and just say, we've changed. And then they send you a link to an equally impenetrable multi-page small print thing that looks like some really hellscape of a bill in Congress. Who wants to read that unless you're a congressional aide and even then just kill me. Absolutely. That's why they divide it up into pieces and chunks. But, um, but the, the issue I think really needs to be solved with some kind of a universal consent document if it, if you would, where there's different levels of, you know, this, we're going to, we're just going to see that you're here. We're going to see that you're here and we're going to know who you are. We're going to see who, you know, that you're here. We're going to know who you are and we're going to know all kinds of things about you based on your presence here, et cetera, and what you do. Um, and, and have that be, you know, like stage one through stage, whatever. And, you know, everything from, you know, you're here to you're here and we just gave you an anal probe. Um, you know, and I mean, some people are cool with that. But, um, you know, depending on what they get in exchange. But, I do, you know, I think that there's just way too much assumption, both on the part of the citizen and the part of the provider of this service, whatever it is, that, um, oh, everything's going to be okay. And I mean, I, I kind of have fallen into there is no privacy, there should be, you know, it's like I fall on both sides of that line depending on the day. But the thing that um, disturbs me the most is the fact that so much of our data, particularly around health, is, is somehow being weaponized against us now, where um, either we're being targeted for ads and services that we're not really sure why, you know, how did you find out about that? because it's coming from somebody that is not who we thought we were talking to before when we made that disclosure, whatever it is, because of that data, you know, handoff. And however de-identified it is, um, it, it, I do think that based on the granular level of data that's available on some of these data profiles that are wandering around out there being sold, it's very easy to figure out who it is that this data set describes. And uh, because of that, um, that, you know, I think that this would you know, it'd flatten the playing field a little bit, you know, the power paradigm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if people, citizens, were both more aware of what they were handing over through this, you know, consent document, and also on the other side, that the providers of services that were collecting this information and asking for this permission um, would have to be honest and clear. In other words, plain language on one page, here's what we're doing, check the boxes that you're okay with. This already exists. Check the boxes that you're okay with, you know, and the stuff that you don't check, we're gonna recognize you, we can't do. And then, and then just act accordingly, for God's sake instead of shifting the rules behind the, behind the curtain. Do we imagine, um, and I'm curious for both of you, uh, let's imagine that we had some of this infrastructure in place. Um, you know, there's a protocol for, called HEART for patients to give permissions for who gets their clinical data. Um, and let's extend it to a broad array of other kinds of digital data. Um, um, who enforces it? You know, uh, that's we, the question, isn't it? How do we, you know, I, I sign up for this uh, capability and um, say you can only use it in these ways. How do I tell whether people are agreeing with it? Who polices that? Does there need to be a policing agency? And are we creating a sort of virtual um, 
replica of our current society in so doing? Um, or, th or do we, how do we think about that differently? So uh, I, I think there, are, that entity could uh, either be a private business or some sort of private enterprise, which again, uh, is also going to have a very long term of terms of service, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and uh, you know, I hope in that situation patients can uh, give a more meaningful consent and uh, uh, you know be more aware of what they are signing for. Uh, however, in those situations, if the if that enterprise violates its terms of services, I think just like uh, today there would be an army of lawyers who are going to sue them. Uh, this, there will be a class action lawsuits against them. And also there are going to be, uh, you know, uh, governmental oversight over them. Agencies such as Office for Civil Rights uh, at HHS would be there to make sure that they are operating within uh, their boundaries. Now, just let me also, because that, that uh, discussion that you have is very, very interesting. And I want, want to clarify something. When we say data is weaponized, uh, we should make it very distinct but, uh, from when we say data is being used. So when you say data is weaponized against me, I can imagine a situation in which, for example, uh, University of Connecticut or the Brookings Institution whom I work for, go after my private data and find something in that in order to fire me. Okay, uh, that is very unlikely unless you are uh, running for public office or some kind of celebrity. You know, uh, there was an article. You're just a bad employee that we want to fire. If I'm a bad employee, they would have <laughs> enough uh, reasons oh, yeah. to do yeah. that. They wouldn't go after my, my private data because. You know, they would be breaking so many different laws if they do that. And I think that they, they would have much easier ways to do that. Now, there was an article with uh, one of my colleagues at, at Brookings that is talking about privacy. And one of the very interesting issues that he was raising is that before the digital era, privacy was defined within the realm of your friends and family members and the people who knew you. Uh, and uh, he gave an example of when he was a teenager, he wanted to go uh, buy uh, a, a not so fancy magazine and he <laughs> had to hide it. Gee, I wonder what magazine, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can imagine. <laughs> and he had to hide the magazine between an issue of New York Times and a Wall Street Journal so that the other customers in the store couldn't see what he is buying. and. The uh, store clerk ended up reading the magazine's name very loudly and embarrassing him again in front of everybody. And, and then well, we kind of like buying condoms at the drugstore. Yeah. Right. So that that was an example. We say that look, you know, my privacy was violated. I was not very happy about that. However, nowadays people go to all, all sorts of online websites and you know disclose uh, very private information about themselves to people whom they don't know. So I think uh, for a typical person, it really matters if my neighbor who says hi to me every morning knows some private information about me, or it is some Silicon Valley intern that uh, they, there is zero chances that he or she will ever meet me, okay? Uh, that, that's one thing. Now, when it comes about the data use, I think it is not a zero sum game. If somebody uses the data that I have created in order to target an ad specifically for me, uh, and I purchase a product or service or medication or whatever that is, it, does he won and I lost? I don't think so. I think if the, if the ad is targeted and it increases the likelihood of purchase, it, it means that a really good trade has been, you know, uh, occurred, which means that we both have benefited. Remember, not so long ago, those online ads on, in, in every website that you went, there were like 20 different ads flashing and they were really, really annoying. Nowadays, the, these ads are really efficient, super smart. They tell you exactly what you want. 
and reduce the search costs for you. So uh, when we are talking about using our private data for marketing, I am not sure I 100% agree with the fact well, that but, see, when I'm I losing say weaponize, money. When I say weaponize, I, you know, it's like ad targeting is, is annoying. But, you know, full disclosure, I run an ad blocker on everything, including Facebook, and it ma makes my life so much simpler and stress-free and just less annoying. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that's me, and that's my choice, and so I do that. There are some people who like to see ads. I think they're weird, but that's another story. But as far as weaponized against them, the thing that, that, I, that concerns me, and this is a scenario that has played out more than once in my, you know, view, and also I've seen many many stories about this happening to other people that i don't know so you know that there is a family history of something in your family and you choose to outside of your health insurance from your employer go and get some genetic essay done and you get some genetic counseling you self-pay for that you didn't you know it's like and um you have not discussed this with anyone at your employer, you are not disclosing this. This is not something that is a disease that you have. It's a disease that you are attempting to assess your risk for because there's a heavy, you know, mm -hmm. and it could be anything from hereditary breast cancer to Alzheimer's to you know, any mm -hmm. one of a number of things that are heritable. Now, if that data is de-identified, haha, again, horse lap and sold, and, um, you know, or say you get the testing done through 23andMe or Ancestry who de, uh, you know, who aggregate and sell that data all over everywhere. And, uh, you know, it's like, that's, that's a disturbing potential of weaponization. And there are times when that, another, you know, I mean, if you are a, um, a relative of the Golden State Killer, Hello, you know, it's like there's, an, I mean, that's not a heritable thing, committing mass murder or a serial killer or whatever, but at least I hope not. But the fact that that data was so searchable and findable within a law enforcement context says that that is also searchable and findable. And I don't think that it would take that much for somebody to figure out how to do that because I know they've already done it. A couple of things um, the, uh, uh, to that point that I think are worth considering here. As soon as at least 3 million people have uploaded their data to publicly searchable databases, anybody in the U.S. is identifiable. Right. And it doesn't matter if the data is de-identified because you can't really de-identify your genome. You are your genome. But you are, yeah. You know, it's associated. Yeah, it's, really, you know, it's like, oh, that's definitely you. It's, yeah, they can take your name off it, but it's still identifiable as you. And so, when we're talking about this level of genomic data, um, as well as the fact that it's data that potentially um, could affect, because mine is out there, it could affect great grandchildren I don't have. Mm -hmm. um, because privacy policies may not last, companies may be destroyed, the data may still be floating around out there. Um, there is a, a longer tail, I think, when we start incorporating genomics into this picture and a, and a whole new set of concerns and risks that we really don't have an infrastructure. But, you know, for both being but, able to preserve the data and make it available to your heirs and assigns, and, and make it useful to them, and also to secure it. And if it turns out to be financially worth it in some future time, monetizing it. So that's where, you know, I got back to my co-op. Um, I do, th and that, not as though that's a, you know, complete solution, but I do think that in, in you know, by grouping together in communities of interest on this, um, whether it's a conditioned community or, you know, a scientific, you know, community, it, it pick one, doesn't matter, just a bunch of people who want to make money off their data um, that are aggregating together. I think that there is power in this as an emerging economic model and one that bears investigation. Uh, you know, it's like, here she goes again. Yes, social enterprise, not socialism. Have you heard me on this topic before? But, um, yeah. <laughs> 
But it just, you know, I mean, I'm a simple creature. I like to boil things down to taglines because most human beings don't have a lot of time. And it's like, give me the short snort. Okay, that's it. But, um, so uh, we're down to our final minutes. Yes, and it's, I've got a hard stop pretty close at four because I got to get to the gym. So I want to so, give Neam and a chance to provide his final words. On I, 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 okay, thank you very much. So, uh, I, and I wanted to say at the beginning, I forgot, so let me say it at the end. I really want to appreciate uh, both of you ladies for taking the time to have this discussion because I believe this is a super important discussion. And it is also very refreshing to see uh, people uh, are still willing to have uh, meaningful discussions about the topics that matter to them, uh, despite the environment that we are living in. This <laughs> day and age. So that, we'll that, just that, say that there, yeah. That, that, that gives me a little bit of hope. And then uh, I, I want to end by saying that maybe I say it because I'm very optimist. But I think there are other very sensitive types of data that are out there, and they will definitely affect not only me, but also people related to me. And one of the examples is my financial data, you know, uh, for, based on which a credit score is calculated. And, uh, you, you know, you were talking about inequality in healthcare, for example, and there was recently a case, I think, against Supreme Court, against uh, talk, talking about these credit card companies offering uh, uh, points, uh, which are tax-free uh, money to people who are, you know, large spenders, which means that they are wealthier. And this is some kind of, you know, transferring money to people who have already, already have it. Them, you yeah. know. Uh, so, what and and you know you can you can think about many different cases in which uh, you know my credit score uh, will affect my children you know and the opportunities that may have or may not have and uh, you know the simplest thing is that when my child generational begins, wealth yeah or you know when my child becomes eighteen years old if I have a good credit score I potentially can co-sign a credit card for her help her boost her you know start. To, building good credit whereas if i don't have it then you know she won't she won't be able to benefit from that or she may even get hurt from that uh however i think you know so so we now are talking about healthcare data because it's a new type of data and as humans it is in our nature to be worried about it and to think very uh, cautiously about its potential uh ramifications but uh, I, I, I think we will figure it out and uh, we'll be fine. <laughs> well, I hope so, but data is the new oil. And yes. the thing that I worry about is that um, those of us who, you know, we're just going to become the thing that's sucked out of the ground as opposed to the owners of what is being sucked out of the ground, uh, the, the originators. We are providing the oil. Mm -hmm. So getting cut in on that new, uh, the, the new e economy that is derived from that is critical. And unless we have that conversation now, we're going to all be digital serfs to a very, very small number of people at the top of the chain. And I worry for humanity at that point. I have, one, I more question. So I have one more question for each of you before we part. Um, Neem, if you could do one thing to change this or change the trajectory of the issue tomorrow, what would it be? I will invest on a platform that enables patients to share their data, uh, even identify data uh, with entities and businesses, either government research or profit, uh, based on a easy to understand and meaningful terms of use. All right, well, I, I will commit, you know, I, I'll, I'll follow on to what Neam said. I will commit to putting some links in the show notes for this that um, will link to the three uh, co-op platforms that I know of now where people are able to join and become part of the data contribution uh, army, the co-ops. Um, but the one thing that I would like to see done is to basically widen the understanding of the use of this co-op model which, you know, again, that's what, I, that's what I'm doing all day, every day, or you know, often every day. But to really flip the, the paradigm so that 
all of the the people who spend so much of their hours and days online and on their phone and you know whatever would understand how much money is being generated off of all of that activity and particularly places like you know like things like facebook in particular um i am also going to link to the frontline uh the facebook dilemma uh two-hour documentary which if it doesn't scare the crap out of you it should or you know if you haven't seen it yet it will scare the crap out of you but the one thing that i want people to to do is just to be aware of the value of what they create every day just by walking around and doing what they do and to start standing up and saying you know I think we could we could come up with a new economy based on this. Let's talk about that and then keep the conversation going. Well, thank you both very much. I think this has been a lovely, interesting, stimulating. Yeah, I think poor Jan was thinking it was going to be a fist fight. <laughs> no, it's been great. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Okay.